God, we never know what is around the next corner, whether it's going to be a dreadful physical diagnosis, an accident, any number of issues of life, family member or friend dying, going off into a crisis eternity. Help us to live every moment for your glory. Never assured of the next moment. We are, life is but a vapor. It's here one moment and then it's gone. Help us to make sure our souls are ready for eternity. That we will face you not as judge, but as Savior and Lord. And what a gracious and benevolent King you are over our lives. God, we read in Genesis 3, when sin entered the picture, all hell literally broke loose on planet Earth. So that all of life from Genesis 3 on for mankind would be characterized by sinfulness and hopelessness outside of Christ. Lord, we live in a sinful world that is populated by sinners of the mind chief. God, we thank you that we can bring our sins to Christ because of that day that we repented of our sins and bowed the knee to Jesus as Savior and Lord. Our lives have never been the same. We read Paul's words to the Corinthians that if any man be in Christ, He's a new creation. All things have passed and all things have become new. Us who are dead are now alive. We've got a, a hope over the grave that we never had before. Thank you for pardon. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for the renewal of our hearts that used to be in rebellion against you, it used to be stony. And now you gave us a heart of flesh, one that's compliant to do your will. But as we've sung this morning, our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. We celebrated the glorious reality, even as we go to the Lord's table after the exposition this morning, that our sin was not taken care of in part, but the whole of it. And so, Lord, help us to be better confessors, constantly keeping the, the plumb line of communion with you going, because we're constantly owning up to our sin and restoring that fellowship with our triune God. Lord, now meet with your church. Teach us the scriptures of what a life of righteousness, a life of faith, a life of obedience looks like. Help us to learn from those early disciples who are not so much unlike us presently disciples of the Lord Jesus. We pray in Christ's great name. Take your Bibles, if you will, and turn with me to Mark chapter 8. I'd like to preach to you a sermon that I've entitled, Leaven Permeates the Boat Conversation. So yes, we are back in Mark 8 uh, frequently because we, I know that we uh, often have visitors that I try to look, and I think that the page number I looked up, there's a there's, uh, few Bibles in the foyer on the table. I think it's uh, page 8. 58 or something like that. Mark 8 is where we're going to be this morning. And before we read the text of verses 14 to 21, just think with me for a moment as we try to orient our hearts to the truth. This is a sermon on the blindness and lack of discernment of the early disciples. You see, they were dangerously close to the hypocritical religious leaders that they and Jesus just left. The earlier verses, before verse 14 that we looked at a couple of weeks ago, are part of the context. You know, the religious hypocrites say, show us another sign. We're not content with all the ones he's already done, right? And uh, Jesus refuses a sign from heaven since it cannot offer the true knowledge of God and man and sin and salvation, false religion, does not provide the truth that accesses the power for people to please God and receive his salvation. All false religious leaders claim to have the truth. But in reality, none of them do. 
And since they do not know the truth themselves, you know, we've run into these religious hypocrites time and again in the life and ministry of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. <coughs> you know, empty hypocrites cannot lead others to the salvation they don't, do not themselves have. Along with their devotees, they all perish. These are the hypocrites that Jesus addressed back in the previous chapter, Mark 7. That Greek term, hypocritus, was originally not a religious term, but a secular term. Referring to an actor who played a role on a stage, and boy, what an act it is. Eventually, it became a religious term in the New Testament used exclusively in a negative sense. Never in a positive. The hypocrite is one who claims to speak for God, but does not. He's a hypocrite. He pretends to be someone he is not. Such is the nature of spiritual deceivers. And Jesus had a way to bring out the worst in people as he promoted God's truth. Boy, religious hypocrisy comes out with fangs when it gets back to your corner and gets exposed for the sham that it is. Though they pretend to speak for God, they are fraudulent liars and deceivers. All throughout the New Testament, we find Paul and other apostles writing about it, these hypocrites. The Pharisees, Jesus said, actually made people into fellow sons of hell in Mark, excuse me, in Matthew 23. So they focus on outward appearance. They hide the truth of who they really are. This is intentional. In the previous chapter, Jesus said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. Mark 7, 6. Disciples of our day need to have eyes open and develop the same discernment Jesus was fostering in those first disciples. Now, in the context of where we're at of Mark 8, not the biblical context, but the life context. Here we are, the Lord's Day, after the beginning of this last week, Monday. What was Monday? Monday was a federal holiday celebrating Martin Luther King Jr. Some of you that know me well know that I don't typically have Christian radio on. I'm uh, not sanctified enough to listen to a lot of the stuff that's on it. Without <laughs> having a temper tantrum. Um, so on Christian radio, uh, when I was, because I've got a very serious thing, uh, serious XM on this uh, truck that's new to us. And, but uh, Christian radio was talking about what a great Christian leader this man was. Though his theology was very liberal, Study his life. In seminary, he made his views clear, saying that the evidence of the virgin birth is too shallow to convince any objective thinker. He stripped divine sonship of Christ and the resurrection of all literal meaning, supposedly in favor of science over scripture, rejecting the supernatural plan of salvation and the Trinity and the substitutionary atonement and the second coming. You erase the substitutionary death of Jesus and you've got nobody between you and the judge, God the Father. He was a proponent of black liberation theology. And when I say that, you know, don't think that this is another white preacher. Those of you that know me well, some of my favorite friends are black people. I love my, my black nephew. Like, like nobody's business. Look at his theology. Central theme of his quote-unquote Christianity was not Christ. It's a crisis Christianity. It was the deliverance of Israel from their slavery in Egypt. 
The Exodus is what he referred to in his famous mountaintop speech, not the death and resurrection of Jesus, the one who conquered the grave. His was not a gospel of salvation from sin, but a gospel of freedom from the oppression of the black man. Theology was rooted in a social gospel, a system that sought to apply Christian ethics to social problems. Now, we admit there's a lot of social problems in his day and in ours. The social gospel addresses poverty and racial injustice and poor education and crime and war, which are real issues. We're not negating that. We're not minimizing it. But what about the foundational biblical doctrine of sin? Jesus came for nothing less than to be a savior for sinners. Sin and salvation and heaven and hell were replaced with the general principle of brotherly love and justice and freedom. In essence, it was an empty call to unity with no truth. Why do I say no, tr no, no, no truth? Uh, our scripture reading in God's Problems, where we're at this morning, Genesis 3. Sin. There must be someone that comes to crush the head of the serpent. Somebody to come deal with our sin. This is what agonized Luther as the Spirit of God was drawing him to salvation. My sin, my sin, what can I do with my sin? Not my social injustice. So yes, as I have walked out on a very thin limb this morning in my opening illustration. <laughs> Here we are. With the beginning of the fourth withdrawal and return to Galilee, Mark 8, verse 14, all the way up through chapter 9, 50, where there's another time where Jesus and his disciples withdraw and they come back. Every time Jesus comes back, it's more hostile than when he left. You know, the, the second feeding of the thousands, it wasn't in, Gen, in, in Jewish land, it was in Gentile land. And so we come back home again. Has it gotten any better? No, it's gotten worse. More hostility because more truth coming from Jesus. Now the, the fourth withdrawal and return comes right after the what? The third. We know our map, don't we? This one is almost entirely devoted to the private training of the twelve. Not a whole lot of public explanation and teaching. You know, these disciples have a long ways to go. But no less than the church of our day needing greater emphasis on training and biblical discipleship after, after our master's order and his example. In person, just like the master. Now, this marks a termination of Jesus' public ministry in Galilee. Only two events during this whole withdrawal, as recorded by Mark, that is not this private training of the twelve. Those that did specifically center on personal discipleship of these young learners. Now, the previous account of verses 10 to 13 we looked at last, uh, or two weeks ago, marked the lowest point in the Galilean ministry. Again, what the religious leaders come to Jesus, show us another sign. He says, you're not going to have any more signs. I'm done. There was obstinate opposition from the Pharisees, and Jesus utter dismay. This was a brief and sadly unredemptive encounter. And what follows here in the text for today is a grave warning in a boat conversation as they leave Galilee again. Here we've got the disciples' wholesale misunderstanding of Jesus' reference to leaven. It's like, you bucketheads, you don't get it again. <laughs> 
In other words, he hasn't left the opposition on the shore. Now, we're not saying that the disciples are in the exact same condition as the religious hypocritical leaders of Judaism. But they're pretty close. He dragged the opposition with him into the boat. You know, like I said, they're, they're dangerously close to hypocritical leaders and almost have become infected with that religion. The hypocrisy of that religion. No, not outright opposition, but a, a bewildering misunderstanding of, by his own disciples. And he's moved to exasperation, similar to Ezekiel. Jesus is exiled among his own people. You know, when I say uh, similar to Ezekiel, Ezekiel said, Son of man, you are living among a rebellious people. They've got eyes to see, you just don't see. They've got ears to hear, but do not hear, Ezekiel 12, 2. It's exactly what Jesus is living through here. Set your eyes, if you would, on Mark 8, beginning in verse 14. Now, verse 14 is just a narrative note. <clears throat> this is not significant yet. Mark tells us they forgot to take bread and did not have more than one loaf in the boat with them. That will come crucial to that context. Verse, eight, verse 15. He was giving orders to them, saying, Watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. They began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. <laughs> Uh, insert my dinner, right? Uh, verse 17. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the five thousand? And how many baskets full of broken pieces you picked up? They said, Ten, twelve. Well, then I broke the seven for the four thousand. How many large baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they said to him, seven. And he was saying to them, do you not yet understand? <laughs> Let that question ring in your ears and in your heart. Beloved, let's, let's learn from the disciples. To cultivate a humble heart of teachability and faith and obedience to Jesus Messiah. We want to cultivate a humble heart of teachability and faith and obedience as present day followers who are not so unlike those that we accuse and point our fingers. At, you bonehead, you should have known better. Yeah, I see me. You know, that's a mirror, is it not? So we start off with a strong warning in verse 15. A strong warning. This next pericope, this section of thought, begins at the beginning of verse 15 with that little conjunction, and. Indicating it's either a continuation of the previous set of verses we looked at two weeks ago, or very closely connected with the scene that is described in verses 11 to 13. The encounter with the Pharisees, in essence, prompts the warning. So, they're in the boat with him, they're leaving the hypocrites, and they're pro getting prone to the same hypocrisy, having eyes that don't see, ears that don't hear, and hearts that are unstirred by the truth that the Master's giving them. Before dealing with the narrative background of verse 14, just, just look at the significance of this strong warning in verse 15. We'll go back up to verse 14 in a moment. Giving orders to them. The term is diastolene, a verb that denotes a strict order or command, as he takes occasion to provide some needed teaching. Let me give you a little note here to, to tuck under your cap. It's not wrong or mean-spirited mean -spirited to point out what is flawed and wrong. Are you listening to the voices of the evangelicalism in our day 
the, if you have the audacity to throw a name or a book or a theology under the bus as a bunch of hogwash and false, that that is uncaring and unloving. Do we not read in the Proverbs? Think about my life here. The kisses of an enemy are deceitful, but faithful are the wounds of a friend. Somebody that loves us enough to call an ace and ace, a spade, spade, and sin, sin. And this is truth, and if this is truth, then that is error. It is false. Jesus gives them some orders. There's truth and there's error, and error masquerades as truth very subtly. Disciples, notice what's going on with the crowd that we just left. One of the things we'll pick up on in the membership class this afternoon, there's a handout uh, for those who are in the church. You look at our doctrinal statement. There's not a whole lot, not to, not to pride ourselves, pat us on the back, because we know a lot of churches that do life and ministry like we do, that has a thorough doctrinal statement, but it's not the norm of our day. Where you spell out what we believe the Bible teaches about this, that, and the other thing. And that we can be doctrinally distinct without being divisive. We're not being condescending to those that haven't arrived at this Uber plane of spirituality and knowledge, right? We just believe that the Bible's clear. It's perspicuous. There's a clarity. God doesn't mumble. We can understand the word of God. And we can affirm sound doctrine. So Jesus is going to um, give sound the warning. Watch out. He says, beware of leaven. So here we've got this double caution. Two verbs of action. Both are imperatives. Disciples, you have no choice but obedience. Watch out and beware. Stressing the attitudes that ought to continue. Watching out calls for a, a mental alertness, not a spiritual sleep. <laughs> Beware demands one to look attentively at the object called to one's attention in order to avoid the danger it presents. They've got no better illustration than what was just done wrong with the religious leaders. The Good Shepherd is filling in, by example, a proper shepherdology. Teach the truth, but make sure you also, disciples, learn how to expose error. He's warning them. Eh, eh. A lot of error. Hypocrisy. The two verbs underscore the intensity of the warning. Now, you notice the Pharisees he's warning them against. He says, watch out, beware, the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Now, let's just stop for a moment. These two groups have nothing to do with each other. There is no connection whatsoever between the Pharisees and the Herodians. Except one thing. They are allied together against Jesus. That's the only commonality. So let's kind of tease out this, the significance of leaven that he warned them about. The leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Why do you take a moment or two? Because this is not like in your baking cupboard where you take down the, the fleshman's yeast. Uh, in the New Testament, they knew nothing about fleshman's yeast. Well, as you do a theology, a biblical theology of leaven in the scriptures, you find in Leviticus 2.11 that leaven was strictly forbidden with certain offerings. And it had to be removed during the Passover, according to Exodus 34, 25. And it readily, ongoing in the progress of Revelation, became a figure of evil and corruption. You say the word leaven, other people think evil corruption. The law regarded it as, a, as symbolic of impurity. 
So that when you got to the New Testament, you got to rabbinic Judaism, leaven became a common metaphor for the evil tendency in man. Now, that evil tendency can take on many specific forms, demonstrated in all kinds of different ways. And it might seem like just a small thing. <clears throat> Nevertheless, it corrupts the whole man. There's only one positive usage of leaven, uh, of leaven in the entire New Testament. And that's in Matthew 13, 13, where Jesus has the audacity as the master teacher to compare his kingdom to a leavening process. That's going to grow and nothing's going to stop it. It permeates everything. Jesus just used it there in Matthew 13 for shock value in comparing his kingdom. But that's a different discussion altogether. I, as I said, that leaven is not identical to yeast. It produced a process of fermentation picturing a pervasive corrupting ten, uh, tendency that works invisibly. And you might scratch your head. Is it doing its job? Is it dead? Assuredly, it is not. You might wonder when periodically, once in a while, we will associate unhealthy doctrines by books and names, and are we being unkind when we do that? It's just a minor thing. The truth is just tweaked a little bit, well then you're just half a step removed from Sola Scriptura and you're standing on the theological banana peel ready to go out from under you at any time. Any time. It's dangerous. It corrupts. Is doctrinal corruption a big deal? Even when it seems minute, you bet. Leaven was a pithy one-word parable for the unseen pervasive influence. I, got, I can control this. I'm just listening to a little bit. Don't you know a little bit? A leaven leavens the whole loaf. So of the dozen remaining New Testament usage, it connotes corruption, unholiness, and danger. Corruption, unholiness, and danger. So as Jesus says to them in verse 17, excuse me, verse 15, watch out, beware of leaven of the Pharisees, leaven of Herod. Maybe we could just put this under two, two little headings. Beware of the teaching of man, and beware of the fear of man along with their corrupting influence. Now, Mark leaves Jesus' meaning uninterpreted. What do you mean, Jesus, by the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod? <clears throat> well, glad you asked, because Matthew answers your question. In Matthew 16, 12, Matthew gives us a note as to what Jesus meant by this leaven. In Matthew 16, in verse number 12, Matthew says, then they understood. He didn't say to beware of the leaven of bread. Not about that one loaf you've got in the boat with you, boys. But the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Beware of the teaching of man. Clearly the Lord was thinking about the penetrating and the corrupting influence of his opponents' teaching. Remember the song we learned in Sunday school for those of you that grew up as a religious hypocrite in church like I did. Be careful little ears what you hear. Be careful little ears what you hear, even on Christian radio. Oh, uh, that's not what I'm saying. Or in your Christian pod tech podcast and all the preaching and teaching you listen to elsewhere. So, in regards to the Pharisees, they have perverted views on moral goodness and moral evil. We took up a whole chapter virtually. Mark chapter 7, verses 1 to 23. You guys are making a big deal, Jesus says, about my disciples eating with unwashed hand. 
And can I tell you that those hands of my disciples are a lot cleaner than your heart? <coughs> Corruption comes within. This is, this is why uh, the monkery failed, because you might get away from the wickedness of the world when you lock yourself up into yourself, but you just locked yourself up with a cesspool of your own wickedness. Your own depraved heart. Pharisees, as religious hypocrites, have a perverted view of goodness and moral evil. It left them morally blind and unable to discern the mission and the character of Messiah. Can we say it this way? Too many people are saying that they are orthodox. Or that they are moral. I don't drink or chew or go to girls that do. Morally, I'm, a, I'm an upstanding citizen. How about your heart? You're successful. You know, we, we need to include that it wasn't just what they taught orally. What the Pharisees demonstrate as they said and didn't what? Didn't do. Hypocrisy. It was willing hypocrisy, knowing how empty they were, how empty their teaching was. Luke notes their hypocrisy in Luke 12, too. Can we, can we say that hypocrisy is different than inconsistency? This is a willful act on the part of these religious ones. The Christian is a contradiction. When somebody is saved of their sins, they turn from their sins and repentance and place their faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And what does the judge of the whole earth do? The judge declares the sinners righteous by faith. Positional righteousness. Clothed in the perfections of their Savior. And yet, we don't practice our righteousness as consistency. There's big gaps in our holiness. There's a lot of potholes of life we keep on falling into. And yet our longings have changed. We delight in righteousness that we don't perfectly practice. That is a huge difference, the Christian who is a contradiction and the religious hypocrite, the Pharisee who knows they are unrighteous and will not turn to him who was so that his righteousness could be credited to them. Abraham believed God and was counted unto him as righteousness. They should have gone Abraham's way. So the only thing uniting these two groups, the, the Pharisees and the Herodians, are their opposition to Christ. You remember the reason for Jesus' securitous journey to Tyre and Sidon and the Decapolis back in chapter 7? May have been motivated, at least in part, by the harassment of the Pharisees and the harassment of Herod Antipas. So Jesus says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, speaking of the, their teachings, their hypocritical teachings, where they say and don't do. Beware of the fear of man and all the corrupting influence. Look at Herod. Herod is the poster child of the second kind of leaven, he warns his followers. Herod's irreligious conduct, his self-seeking political views, his corrupt practices, we're not going to go back to what we've already studied in Mark about Herod's incest and his murder of John <coughs> just to appease a wretched wife. To speak of Herod is to speak of adultery, is to speak of murder, is to talk about hastiness and swearing. Better to bow not than to bow not repay, right? He's the example of artificial piety. I'll hear you again on that matter, John. That isn't something my wife wants to hear. He's the example of hatred of Christ. Either you're for him or you're against him. There's no middle ground, Herod. 
a warning against the godlessness of the man of the world. His example set the policy for the Herodians. The Sadducees, though were just united with the Pharisees, fell in with the worldly policy of the Herodians. Back in Mark 3, they're mentioned together. Notice in Mark 3, in verse number 6, the Pharisees went out and immediately began conspiring with the Herodians against Jesus as to how they might destroy him. Why are they doing this? Because Jesus had the audacity on the Sabbath to break his own law and heal the guy with the hand. And so they unite together against Jesus. You know, how are we going to destroy this man? You fast forward to chapter 12, which we haven't gotten to yet in Mark's Gospel. Mark 12 and verse number 13. Then they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to him, to Jesus, in order to trap him in a statement. You know, their, their political ideologies are different from each other. Their religiosity is different from each other. The only thing that united these two tribes, these two groups, was their assault on Jesus. You know, then you add in Matthew 22, 16 to what we just turned to. You've got three clear passages designing the opponents of Jesus. Or, excuse me, designating the opponents of Jesus. So the, the Herodians are more or less a veiled opposition to Roman procuratorship. They desire a restoration of the national kingdom under one or other of the sons of Herod. Jesus clearly expected his disciples to know the connotation. Doesn't matter whether it's the Pharisees or the Herodians. They were culpable for what he meant. They should have had fresh on their minds. That the issue is totally the brave hearts. Mark fleshes out that out in chapter 7, verses 1 to 23. The wickedness is not outside of you, it is inside of you. That ought to be what's resonating in their hearts and minds. Just a moment of reflection would have shown them that he's obviously talking in verse 15 about spiritual defilement. When he says, beware. Dear disciple of Jesus, in our day, these assaults take place in so many different ways. One of the most recent uh, illustrations I can think of is that currently in our counseling class, where we have... Uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, we were comparing all the uh, methods of counseling. You either take those that are relying lock, stock, and barrel on divine revelation, God who created the soul of man as to why man does what he does, or you've got all the other human models with fallen logic applied. You've got psychology's war on the conscience. Where, let's, let's sear it, let's break it. Keep on sinning, you'll feel better. No, you'll break your conscience, the gift that God's given you. Guard your conscience. Inform it with scripture. The assault on guilt. Where Freud says, well, it's false guilt, just ignore it. No, the Bible says all of guilt is real. Read Genesis 3. We live in a sinful world populated by fellow sinners of whom we, each one of us is chief. There's the assault on conscience, the assault on guilt. How about this assault on, a, on anthropology, the study of man? How are we going to understand man? Read your Bible. Read your Bible. Read what we did this morning in, in Genesis 3. That does not paint man as a neutral party. The, the Bible teaches that right out of the shoot when we are born, we are born sinners. We are not a blank slate, a tabula rotha. We, we're not innately good. We are sinners, we are depraved, we're dead in our transgressions and sins. 
So we need to use the Bible to develop our hermarchiology, the doctrine of sin. Not a blank slate. It's not a matter of rehabilitating man. You might be a moral sinner, but if you haven't dealt with the heart, it is not sanctification. It's not done for the glory of Jesus. Changing us from the inside out. So that the outside is a better mirror of what's inside. Not true of the Pharisees. Not a matter of behavior modification or changing somebody's environment. Or, you know, some of the earlier psychologists said, that it's a matter of logic. Well, how did the logic work for you the last time that you ate of your passion? Because we are passion-driven, not logic-driven. Well, let's get back to preaching rather than that one. The basic issue whether it be the grouping of the Pharisees, or the Sadducees, or the Herodians, all had a distorted, wrong idea about the kingdom. It wasn't the kingdom of the heart that Jesus was set up residence in. The Pharisees molded it into trained it, uh, tradition of the elders, conformed to the tradition of the elders. The Sadducees explained away the Old Testament predictions about it. And the Herodians saw some member of Herod's family as the promised king. All these ideas had to be stripped away from the true picture of the Messianic king about to surface. Him who would rule in the hearts of his citizens by faith. Shortly now, before we end this chapter, we're going to finally get the right confession. <coughs> When Jesus asked the question, who do men say that I am? <clears throat> and by divine revelation, God's kindness, God reveals to Peter, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well, good job, Peter. Go ahead and blast. You got the answer right. And so you keep on getting it wrong with the rest of the disciples. They're going to constantly follow that. So let's move on to that, the, the typical obtuseness. Mark gives us the narrative note in verse 14 that they'd forgotten to take bread and didn't have more than one loaf in the boat with them. So when Jesus spoke to them in the boat, saying, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of, of Herod, all that they're thinking of is the physical, the bread they brought with them that had been leavened. You know, they, they began to discuss with one another. Notice verse 16. To discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. What? I'm not talking about bread, boys. You know, they reason among themselves, discussing the meaning of Christ's warning in animated conversation. Well, here's what we can do. Notice again Mark's theme about the disciples' lack of understanding. Uh, you know, he asks a, uh, a barrage of questions later on, verse you know, 17, that we'll, we'll look at later on. But go back to chapter 4, would you? This is not a unique situation in the boat. This is not uncommon to them. Or should I say us, right? Uh, Mark 4, 13. He said to them, do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all the parables? You know, if they don't get the parable of the soul right, they're not going to get the rest of the parables right. You know, he's, you get it, guys? Go to verse 41 of chapter 4. They became very afraid and said to one another, Who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So the God that was outside the boat jumped in the boat and found the storm outside the boat and then were scared of God in the boat and the storm that was outside of them. Who is this? Good question, guys. Um, we're going to eventually get the answer right. Go to chapter 6, verse 37. He answered them, you give them something to eat. What, you remember what was going on previous to this verse? Uh, here they are and. uh, the upper northern area of the Sea of Galilee, and it's getting late, and they're wondering, how are we going to get bread for all these people? And Jesus puts the, the, the burden on them and says, feed them. 
We were going to do that. Now, this place is desolate. It's already quite late. Do you not realize who's there? And then he began to multiply what meager amount of food they already had. So that they had more of a doggy bag at the end of the account than at the beginning of it. Where Jesus feeds thousands, maybe upwards of 15 to 20,000 people. Verse 52 of the same chapter. We're told that they gained, hadn't gained any insight from the incidents of the loaves, but their heart was hardened. Now, careful here. Heart was hardened? Who else had Jesus said that about? The Pharisees, they are, they are deathly close to the infection of the leaven of their lives and their teaching. Careful, guys. We get to chapter 7 and verse number 18. He said to them, are you so lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from the outside can't defile him? Guys, are you listening to what I'm saying? You get to chapter 8, verse 4. His disciples answered him, where will anyone be able to find enough bread here in this desolate place to satisfy these people? So now we're in the Gentile land. We're going to have a feeding all over again. Yeah, a few less thousand people, so no big deal. Still a miracle. And they don't remember uh, back in Galilee what Jesus had already done. They are unaware of their actual condition. They're quibbling about the meaning of bread. No bread. We've got one loaf. Were they really thinking that we, he was forbidding buying bread from these enemies? Is that what he's talking about? They grossly misinterpret his spiritual warning in a material way. Notice, spiritually dense, looking at here and now, the physical reality. They're clueless that they're being infected by a deadly cancer. Just like the Pharisee a couple of moments before who said, show us a sign. Jesus, we're not quite convinced yet that you're God in the flesh. <coughs> not at all talking about the one loaf, guys. They're displaying amazing blindness to spiritual truth. And not just blindness, eventually failure to comprehend will produce a hardness of heart. You keep on this trajectory, you keep on being infected by the leaven of the rest of the religious crowd, the worldly ones as well, you're going to sear your conscience. In effect, it's the same spirit for which Jesus condemned the Pharisees. The danger is more deceptive in their case because they're, they're daily in contact with Jesus. Oh, another miracle, several miracles today, just like yesterday. They kind of, well, if we say they lose the one, are losing the wonder of it all, we've got to ask ourselves, do they ever get it? Do they get the wonder of walking with God? They're displaying amazing blindness to spiritual truth. <clears throat> Daily contact with Christ. They are with Jesus. Just like his mother and brothers back in chapter 3 and verse 14, they were with Jesus. That could actually lead them to presume that they're also with him in purpose and mission. Just because they were physically with him doesn't mean that they're really with him. Their proximity has to grow into understanding. Just being near Jesus doesn't mean you're about Jesus' business. Okay. So your proximity has to grow into understanding, and your understanding has to grow into faith. Or else, just like Judas will do, it will in the end, in the end inoculate you to the meaning of Jesus' person and his work. They're wrestling with the faith column here. A skeptical physician said to his Christian patients, I could never understand saving faith. 
I believe in God, and I suppose I believe in Jesus Christ. I'm not conscious of any doubts. I believe Jesus Christ was the Son of God, and I believe in the Bible, yet I am not saved. What is the matter with me? Well, said the patient, a week ago, I believed in you, Doc. Then as a very skillful physician, I believed that if I should get sick and put myself in your hands, I would be healed. In other words, I trusted you. For two days now, I've been talking or taking some mysterious stuff out of a bottle. I don't know what it is. I don't understand it, but I am trusting in you. Now, whenever you turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and say, Lord Jesus, Christianity seems to me to be full of mysteries, a bunch of stuff I just don't get. I don't understand them, but I believe thou art trustworthy and I trust thee. I commit myself to thee. That is faith. A very simple thing, is it not? The faith of the patient didn't heal him. It was the remedy that healed him, but the faith took the remedy. Not enough for these disciples to even be wowed and dazzled by the miracles that the Pharisees reject. You're with me, guys, says the disciples. Do you get it? Are you depending upon me? So he gives all these questions of conviction in verses 17 to 21. Because they're lost in their discussion. We got no bread. Just this one needs the loaf. Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you discuss the fact that you've got no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you not have a hardened heart? Or, or excuse me, do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes do you not see, having ears do you not hear, do you not remember? <laughs> Jesus, aware of the discussion at the other end of the boat. He knows what's going on in their heart. And he musters a little counteroffensive here. He's got a prompt perception of their unwarranted view, so he speaks out in sharp rebuke. Since they're in the same proximity as him and they're following him, it's probably not as, it's not hostile like it was to the Pharisees. But he's got no tolerance for the low and spiritually dull meaning that they've given his warning. We've got a series of seven questions just to press them. Questions are great for teaching, are they not? They're great for conviction, too. Now, these questions convey surprise and yet indignation. He combines pleading with censure. Why are you discussing the fact that you've got no bread? That word discussion, dialogizify, can mean to reason or consider. Mark uses it several times, about seven in his gospel account. And what's interesting is, in none of those times that Mark uses it, does he use it in a positive twist. It's always negative. It's a bad discussion. It's a discussion that should not be taking place. Every instance, it describes various parties. It doesn't matter if it's the scribes or the disciples or the Sanhedrin attempting to resolve the meaning of Jesus on their own terms, in their own way, in their own fleshy plan. Here's the bread of life. And you're talking about a, a, a crusty loaf. Matthew notes in addressing them, Jesus said, Oh, ye of little faith. Do you hear the passion? The exasperation? And yet the patience of our Savior? Now, their trouble was little faith in him. They still failed to perceive who he really is. Human ruminations are futile, they don't lead to understanding. Logic, human reason, all of its flaws is tainted by our sin. Do you not perceive? Do you not understand? Do you guys have a hardened heart? The end of verse 17. 
Instead of becoming spiritually enlightened, have they allowed their heart, their inner moral being to reach a state of being hardened? It's getting old. You're healing people. You're throwing demons out. You're creating food in front of us. And they're not cultivating a heart of humble teachability and trust. When he says you have a hardened heart, the grammar here denotes a present state of insensitivity. As a result of a past, pro uh, past process. Don't think that it just now started in the boat. This is kind of the end of the line where they've been having these discussions. They've been slow to learn right along. You don't arrive here without a lot of sellouts previously. They are deluded, and they are one step away from that hardness of heart and being totally absorbed by the leaven of the hypocrites. Here he asks three further questions in verse 18. Having eyes, don't you see? Having ears, don't you hear? And you do not remember? Probably the extent and the cause of their hardness of heart is their soul so dull and unperceptive that they can't use their eyes. We're taking all this by faith, are we not? We're reading the gospel record of those that saw this. You know, this metaphor on eyes prepares the way for the next pericope, the next teaching, the next sermon in our text for next week of somebody who is physically blind. And just to give you a a, a preview. Why is it a two-stage healing anyways? That's to mirror kind of their two-stage faith. They just don't get it. They're their eyes, their ears, their memory to penetrate in the meaning of his word. Have they in fact become like those outside? Back in chapter 4 we contrasted the outsiders and the insiders. There are those like these guys who are in the inner sanctum of the life of Jesus where he is personally discipling them. There's a higher accountability here. He is no longer going to cast pearls before the swine in public. He's schooling these guys. Guys, you are right on the precipice of gaining it all or losing it all. With the mysteries of the kingdom that I will not reveal to them outside. Do you not remember? Do you not remember? Has their memory failed them concerning the things that they physically saw him do? If Scripture's his own best commentary, we've been relying some on Matthew's notes in Mark. You know, that when he says, don't you remember, that's, that's Matthew 16, 8, where he, Matthew fills in a little more of the puzzle. And when he says that this is a faith issue, your little faith, Calvin's comment is apt here. He says, from these words, the question in other words, we infer that all who have once or twice experienced the power of God and distrust it for future are convicted of unbelief. For it is faith that cherishes in our hearts the remembrance of the gifts of God. And faith must have been laid asleep if we allow them to be forgotten. Thank you, French theologian John Calvin, to remind us, present-day disciples, how prone to forgetful we are forgetting. Has God ever proven himself unfaithful in our lives? And we go from difficulty to difficulty. We wonder if God, who is sovereign and good, is going to do this obstacle any different than he's done all the other ones. Lord, we only got one loaf. They say it's not about the loaf. You've got the bread of life and the boat with you. You know, as if the series of convicting questions are not enough, Mark concludes with a painful reminder of the results of the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000. Here we've got a direct allusion to the miracles of chapter 6 and the beginning of chapter 8. 
They witnessed the excessive full baskets of leftovers. And now they doubt his sufficiency in the boat. You know, he's, he's helping them remember. When I broke the seven to the four, how many large baskets full of broken pieces to pick up? Seven, Lord. You know, as they kind of, I, I wonder if they're hanging their head. You know, <laughs> yes, Lord. Uncle, forget it. Do you get it? He rebukes with prophetic lamentation the eyes and the ears, just like the prophets did for the stiff-hearted in their day. Jump down Jeremiah 5.21 if you would. Jeremiah 7, 21. Jeremiah says, now hear this, O foolish and senseless people. How's that to win friends and influence enemies? <laughs> foolish and senseless people who have eyes but don't see, who have ears but do not hear. I wonder if they were reflecting upon Ezekiel. When the Lord, word of the Lord came to Ezekiel, saying, Son of man, you live in a midst of a rebellious house who have eyes to see but don't see, ears to hear but do not hear, for they are a rebellious house. Now, when God schools us in our own depravity and our own rebellion, that's not bad news, that's good news. When you call something sin, you know what to do with it, right? We re re repent and forsake it. No excuse. Those who participate in these two particular miracles, not to mention the dozens of others, to fail to grasp the significance of the one who performed them, there is no excuse. They already had two size mind, two signs. The religious, the, the hypocrites that show us a sign they already had. And Jesus reminds them of two of those signs. And it made him no wiser. The gist was applied to the outsiders back in chapter 4, in which the language of Isaiah 6, 9, and 10 is used to describe the outsiders. Now it's describing the insiders, those in the boat, his followers then. Be careful of divine hardening. You're not guaranteed tomorrow to get right with God. You're not to mark, uh, guarantee that a little more sign, a little more, will convince you to be converted and to go God's way. If not careful, God will abandon you in your unbelief. If you continue to hold on to sin and not bow to Christ to rule over you, for he's a benevolent Lord. You know, you know, his questions concerning the last two miraculous feedings were aimed at arousing their memory. And it wasn't for them to expect another miraculous meal. Yet had they remembered and understood the miracles, they would not have now been so preoccupied with their own anxieties. They would have recognized the authority of him who was speaking to them and given him their attention, their allegiance, their trust, all of their lives. Do you not understand when I broke these? Reminded them that his own act had twice created material abundance in a time of crisis. If they understand the spiritual reality, the physical is all taken care of. The chapters 8 through 10 of this section of Mark is just a patient re-education by our benevolent Lord. They're still going to be bewildered by the turn of events when they get to Jerusalem. They'll run away in Gethsemane. They'll leave the ladies to watch at the end of Golgotha. But they're starting to get it slowly. Just like our sanctification is ever so progressive, is it not? And Mark just stops with that last question. Indicating that Christ allowed the disciples to find their own answer. He comes to them in force at the beginning of this pericope, saying, watch out, be aware. You're on your guard. Keep looking out. Keep being on guard. Because they're constantly in danger. Danger of 
paying too much attention to the views of those whose teaching was opposed to the teacher. just don't get it. You know, I was with some folks this week who just don't get it. There was a passage that we opened up together in Hebrews 13. As he warns them of the leaven of the Pharisees, the leaders, the spiritual leaders of their day, so the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 13, 7, he says, consider those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. There is to be godly leadership in the church house today, is there not? You've got biblical qualifications of elders and whatnot. Beware, sheep, of unqualified, ungodly teachers and leaders who are hypocritical just like the Pharisees. Who said and didn't do. Time and truth go hand in hand. People are not time to know the truth about the hypocrites, but sometimes it's too late. Might not come out for a while. <coughs> you know, these synoptic accounts in the Gospels honestly portray the struggles that Jesus' disciples have in believing. Though faith of a mustard seed moves mountains. All the disciples were indicted for a lack of faith. Mark, in particular, calls attention to Jesus' upgrading of the disciples for their hard hearts, their spiritual obtuseness, and warns them, you've got to make up your mind, and beware of all those around you that seem to be purveyors of the truth, when in reality, they are hypocrites. God, would you cultivate in the heart of your disciples today, give us teachable hearts, Help us to discern the issues of life and follow you and your truth lock, stock, and barrel. Help us to be up to date with our God, up to date with our neighbor. What we understand is the difference between being an inconsistent Christian who is striving for holiness and a hypocrite who doesn't care to set of wickedness within. We understand that to be a Christian is to be a contradiction. God, give us greater consistency in our pursuit of holiness, that we might better image you to the world who so desperately needs the Savior. We'll be cautious to give you the praise in your Son's name for his sake. Amen.